This is a question from AQA A-Level Chemistry. It is from the paper three component looking at the required practicals. And this one is based on RPA5. I'm gonna recommend as always that you pause on each section, have a go for yourself, and then you get to see where your strengths are and what you need to develop. So to begin, let's have a look at parts A, B, and C. And finally, we have parts D, E, F, G, and H. And when you are ready, we will take a look at the answer. So taking a look, here is part A again. We've got quite a lot of information here, cyclohexene. We've got its boiling point, which is significantly lower than that of cyclohexanol. We are preparing cyclohexene using conch phosphoric acid and the equation has been provided. We've then got a method, uh, 10 cm cubed of cyclohexanol, density is given in a round bottom flask, 3 cm cubed of conch phosphoric acid, um, a few anti-bumping granules, Student heated the mixture, collected the liquid that distilled at temperatures below 100, distillate poured into a separating funnel, washed by shaking with sodium carbonate, periodically separating funnel inverted and the tap opened, aqueous layer discarded, final organic product dried using anhydrous calcium chloride. After drying, drying agent was removed by filtration under reduced pressure. So in part A, we have got the student collected 5.97 grams of cyclohexene in the experiment. What would the percentage yield be? So we're going to start off by looking at the moles of cyclohexanol. And we need to do a couple of calculations here. First of all, we are going to look at volume, multiply that by density, and that's going to give us the mass. Once we've got the mass, we are able to divide that by the MR of cyclohexanol, which if you add those up, that will come to 100. And that tells us that we actually started with 0.096 moles of cyclohexanol. Now from there, we can go on to work out the maximum theoretical mass of cyclohexene. We know from the equation it's a one-to-one -one ratio, so we know that we've got 0.096 moles. And we're going to multiply that by the MR of cyclohexene, which if you add those up, comes to 82. And that tells us that we could have made 7.87 grams. However, it tells us up at the top here, which I've highlighted in pink, that we actually only made 5.97. So our percentage yield is what is 5.97 as a percentage of 7.87. So 5.97 over 7.87 multiplied by 100, we get a value of 76%. Moving on to part B, describe a test tube reaction on the product to show that the cyclohexanol had been dehydrated. Well, what we've got to look at here is that the cyclohexanol being dehydrated would make cyclohexene. So we're looking for a test for alkenes. That makes it a little bit more straightforward. We add bromine water. And if there is an alkene present and dehydration has taken place, the bromine water will decolorize or change from brown to colorless. On to part C, suggest why sodium carbonate was used to wash the distillate. And again, what you're trying to think of here, if you're not sure, if you're trying to work your way through a question and you're not so confident, is what do we know about sodium carbonate? Well, sodium carbonate, metal carbonates react with acids. And we have got an acid in here. We've got conch phosphoric. So this is going to neutralize the acid catalyst. It's going to get rid of that. Let's now move on and take a look at parts D through to H. Why is it important to open the tap of the separating funnel periodically? Well, we're thinking here about gas buildup. We're going to prevent the buildup of pressure. Give a property of anhydrous calcium chloride other than its ability to absorb water that makes it suitable as a drying agent in this preparation. So what we're looking for here is that it would not dissolve in the cyclohexene. Um, moving on to the diagram, apparatus used to remove the drying agent. So when we're filtering under reduced pressure, there is very specific apparatus that we need. It's a particular shape of funnel and it is a conical flask with a sidearm. We call it a Buckner funnel 
and a buckner flask. The buckner flask, we have got there the vacuum coming from the sidearm, the bung in there to prevent any air getting in, and we've got to include the filter paper in the diagram as well so that we can see where we are going to collect our sample. So the diagram should look something like this. Incidentally, it says describe the apparatus. And you could have done this in words, but if they ask you to describe apparatus, I would always recommend draw it out. Moving on to part G, a sample of cyclohexene has been contaminated with cyclohexanol. The cyclohexene can be separated by column chromatography. Silica gel is used as the stationary phase and hexane as the mobile phase. Why would cyclohexene have a shorter retention time than cyclohexanol? Well, what we're looking at here is that we have got different polarities. Cyclohexanol is more polar or cyclohexene is less polar in the comparison of the two. And what that then means is that the cyclohexene would have a greater affinity to the mobile phase. That means it's going to go through at a different rate. There will be a different retention time. And finally, a little bit of organic analysis here. Explain how an infrared spectrum could confirm the cyclohexene did not contain any cyclohexanol. So on infrared, we're thinking about some of the key peaks. Remember, you're provided with this data on the back of the periodic table or in your data book. There wouldn't be a peak at 3230 to 3550 if there was no cyclohexanol. That takes us to the end of this question. Thank you for listening and goodbye.